We study billionaires, and this is episode 60 of The Investor's Podcast. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll read the books and summarize the lessons. They'll test the waters and tell you when it's cold. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. Hey, how's everybody doing out there? This is Preston Pish, and I'm your host for The Investor's Podcast. And as usual, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson, out in Denmark. Got a great guest for you today. His name is Colin Roach. Colin is the author of the book, Pragmatic Capitalism, and he also manages an amazing website that has fantastic articles on financial markets. Colin is the founder of the asset management company called OrCam Financial Group. The thing that really attracted us to uh, Colin was his white paper that he wrote titled, Understanding the Modern Monetary System. In this white paper, Colin talks about the fundamental architecture of how the banking system works and uh, how that understanding defines where we are at in the current financial markets. Based on Colin's firm understanding of how the system works, and he's been able to make some really bold predictions in the past that have really amazed a lot of people in the investing community, and that's why we really wanted to bring him on the show. So I want to just lay out a couple of these predictions that he's made in the past. The first and most impressive prediction was this idea that Colin said that inflation or hyperinflation was not going to occur after the U.S. central banks initiated quantitative easing. So far, Colin has been exactly right with that prediction, and that surprised a lot of people because as everyone knows, this QE thing was just kind of unheard of in the United States. And a lot of people, when they initiated, were saying, this is going to cause massive inflation. We're actually seeing the exact opposite thing happen. Colin was one of those few people early on that said, you guys got this all wrong. This is not how this is going to go down. And as far as I'm concerned, that adds enormous credence behind what he actually knows and understands. Another thing that Colin was saying, he was on Bloomberg multiple times, uh, not immediately after the crash, but closely after the crash. I want to say around the 2010 to through 2012 timeframe. And Colin was saying, hey, U.S. equity market's going to boom. There's a serious bull coming here. And he was exactly right with that prediction as the stock market went wild from that time clear up to now in 2015. Another prediction that Colin made was back in 2011, he said that the silver market was in a huge bubble that wasn't sustainable. He's been exactly right with that prediction as well. Almost perfect timing whenever he made that prediction, because now we're seeing ultimate lows in the silver market. So with those few predictions, he has a lot of other ones that he's made in the last decade that have really come to fruition. It just really kind of outlines and shows you that he really has a model that he understands and that works, that represents what's actually happening in reality. So what I really want to do on today's show is talk about that monetary model that Colin has outlined in his white papers. And I also want to ensure that we have a really good handoff to these white papers in our show notes so our audience can click on this and see all this information that he's putting out on the internet for free. So Colin, with all that said, Thank you so much for coming on our show. We are really excited about this interview. I know I've been waiting for months to get you on the show because I'm really excited to talk to you. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I uh, also appreciate you leaving out all my bad predictions there. That was really nice of you. <laughs> What's one of the things that you've messed up? Because I think that that's important to highlight because I know I have so many mistakes. Well, gosh, I mean, this one's just sort of front and center. I don't know how many people predicted this whole China thing that's been going on this year, but I certainly overlooked it. I mean, part of it, I think, is just the opaqueness of the Chinese economy. You know, I think a lot of us thought China was slowing down, but it's turned out to be a much bigger concern than I think a lot of people really expected it to be. And that's, you know, to a large degree, I think the, the way that it's kind of reverberated through everything over the summer and into you know, the last few months has been pretty surprising. I'd say that's been a pretty big one that kind of took me by surprise. Even though I do a lot of global macro work, I think the degree to which the Chinese situation has impacted everything was pretty surprising. And I think for a lot of people, they're just struggling with wrapping their head around, is the information that I'm reading and the data that I'm getting, is it real? Is it something that I can actually uh, hang my hat on at the end of the day and trust? That's one thing. I keep talking about this going forward because China's becoming such an important part of the global financial system. It's kind of worrisome to think that this is potentially an economy that could really start to drive global growth to a larger and larger degree. And you can hardly trust anything that comes out of the government. I've spent 
countless hours trying to build some sort of a model that would apply to the Chinese economy in the same way that I use models that apply to the U.S. economy. And I can't do it because the data is just almost completely manufactured and massaged to the point where it's practically useless. Yeah. And I think that's the big concern here. And and we were talking about this with another guest earlier is so much of Japan's economy is pendant on their top line revenue from trade with China. And China has such an enormous impact on Japan. And we've seen their market go 100% in the last two years because of this insane, they're calling it QQE because it's so drastic over in Japan. They're pumping so much money into their economy by buying back these bonds that they're drying up the entire bond market over there. It's just, it's really interesting and it's hard to know what's... Japan's Japan's got the problem where you can't print people. And so, (laughs) you know, they can keep printing as much money through QE as they want to. But the bottom line is Japan's got a massive demographic problem. So it's funny because we got all these questions. We're not even close to getting near them and we're already having an awesome dialogue with you. And I've got one more question before we even hit the list. So I'm real curious because I've been talking on the show about how I really think there's issues over in Japan. I think that they've got a lot to be concerned about, even though they're still executing this massive QE program. Do you see the China thing impacting Japan? And do you see that there's trouble around the corner there? I mean, when we look at their GDP growth and their inflation numbers, it's dismal at best. Do you see it getting worse from here over there? Gosh, everything is impacted by the Chinese slowdown. Anything in the the regional area there. I mean, even as far as Australia and I mean, anything in Southeast Asia really is pretty interconnected into China. Japan is a lot more independent than a lot of the other economies are over there just because they have such a massive entrepreneurial base of their own. I mean, they have in terms of where a lot of the the biggest, most important companies in Asia come from, Japan has always sort of been the central hub there. So they have sort of an inherent hub of production that underlies all of their economic output that at the end of the day, That's one of the most important things that any economy can have. As long as you have an economic base that is really nice and diverse and innovative, most importantly, really innovative, you can overcome a lot of problems over the long term. And that's kind of one of the big things that we've seen out of Japan is that at the end of the day, they're still a huge innovator in the global economy. And that's been the thing that's, I think, kept that boat afloat for a long time, although they have what is ultimately really just a big demographic problem inside of their economy. So they're a little more autonomous than I think a lot of the economies that are really close to China, but they're still impacted to a huge degree just because they rely on China increasingly for so much of what they export. Well, and I think it's really interesting that you bring up this demographic problem in in Japan. And first, now you read quite a few books recently about valuation and the psychology and how the market misprices equities. And one of the things that is repeated is how we tend to overvalue the importance of these, let's call them internal factors. Internal factors would be something like demographic, something that I guess most people know. And then a lot of people would put emphasis on that. That's just like an overall observation, I guess, fighting academic papers and some books. How do you see that in the uh, Japanese equities market right now? Do you think there's a general skepticism that is perhaps exaggerated in the Japanese market because of the problem that they're having, not only with the monetary policy, as Preston is talking about, but also with the demographic problem? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a really, to use a really crude model of the economy is to include population growth in the model. I mean, you don't need population growth over the long term, but... Ideally, you have an economy that not only has productivity growth increasing over time, but also has growing population growth because it's sort of a double whammy. I mean, theoretically, you can overcome population growth. And actually, if you look at the, the total return of the, of the Nikkei since the early 90s when they had sort of their big bubble and even their GDP, they've seen a pretty actually impressive rate of growth over time in both despite the fact that they've had this huge demographic problem and what was, it all kind of started to boil over with the big bubble that they had in real estate in the stock market there. But then it's really been exacerbated by the demographic problem they've had. I wouldn't say that the demographic issue is something that 
it has to put negative pressure on either valuations or the stock market in general, but it depends because you have to have that underlying productivity base. And really, like I said before, the base of innovation, uh, innovation can overcome so many things, government regulations, demographic problems. I mean, we see a great example is in the USA where we see what looks increasingly like overregulated or just highly regulated industries where the innovators in the USA, they keep going other places. I mean, the financial industry is sort of the best example because the financial industry is a place where we keep seeing basically big banks and in financial innovation, sort of financial engineering, skirt regulatory overreach to some degree. And the regulators are trying to keep up, but innovation keeps sort of circumventing it all. And obviously the internet and the technology space are even better examples of that. But so the bottom line is innovation can overcome a lot of big problems. And that is something that the Japanese still have. I mean, there's closest thing to true capitalism in Asia that we really have. All right, Colin. So let's go ahead and uh, get to the actual questions we had. <laughs> that was a fantastic discussion. My first question, and I really wanted to ask this to people get to know you a little bit better, was how did you get your start in investing? And more importantly, why did you focus so much on understanding how central banks and credit cycles work? I kind of came into the markets in the really the late 90s and the early 2000s, kind of during the big tech boom and bust. And so I think I always had a sort of inherent skepticism about the markets just because I my first experience was sort of being thrown into the fire of the of the tech bubble and seeing a market where everything just seemed to go down all the time. But I basically sort of developed almost a self-taught sort of economic perspective where I probably leaned a lot more towards almost a sort of free market or Austrian economics perspective to some degree because I was a market practice. It just seemed so obvious to me that the markets operated better when people weren't constantly intervening in them. The financial crisis kind of changed a lot of my model. I had been really trying to figure out why correlations all went to one back in 2008-09. I don't know if you remember, but back in, in that period, the correlations of almost all financial markets went to one, basically. And it didn't almost didn't matter if you were a value investor or if you were a growth investor or where you were regionally or what asset class you were even in. When the central banks all started to get so involved and the government started to all get so involved in the economy back then, everything sort of started to trend together. And that really changed my perspective on things because it made me realize that these entities increasingly were probably going to be involved in everything that much more going forward. And the big one obviously was quantitative easing, which was this completely new program that really, I don't think anybody really understood it, but although I'm not a trained economist, because I'm a market practitioner, I've sort of relied to a large degree on my contacts on Wall Street. So I ran a limited partnership for seven years, basically through the financial crisis. And one of the things I constantly relied on was to understand the world better by talking to people who were kind of on the ground understanding things. So bankers, investment bankers, traders on Wall Street. These are just lots of either friends or colleagues that I have in the industry. And it was funny when the financial crisis broke out and quantitative easing was initiated, a lot of the people that I was speaking to on the ground were telling me very different things about the way this would unfold than what you were reading in the mainstream media or even what a lot of the actual academic economists were saying. And I had this sort of juxtaposition there where I was sort of had my ear to what was an operational reality relative to what looked like almost a, an academic or theoretical perspective, which was more the, the money printing sort of idea that you got from the mainstream media and whatnot and the sort of the driving hyperinflationary view. Fantastic. And I just want to highlight to our audience, this paper that Colin had written, definitely read this because what Colin lays out is just fantastic. And it really debunks a lot of myths that I think a lot of people have. So I would actually like to talk about this paper because one of the things that you bring up is the 
problems with fiat currencies. And I think it's really interesting, and it's also something that Preston and I have brought up on earlier shows. You talk about the value of any form of fiat money is ultimately derived from three key linkages. And the first one you mentioned is output and production. The second one is money supply management. And the third one is law and regulation. Colin, could you please elaborate on that? Yeah, so money is a really strange thing when you think about it. I love kind of going back to the origin of the word credit because the word credit has traditionally been used as being synonymous with money, basically. And the word credit is derived from the Latin word credere, which means to believe, basically. And that's ultimately what money really is, is money is this sort of trust-based system of accounting, really. It's for all practical purposes, the money is just a tool. It's a medium that we use as a record of account to basically account for the way that we interact in a monetary economy. So the reason why I really highlight these three linkages is because I think that these are the three things that really make the monetary system viable over time. So for instance, output and production are by far the, they're the base of all of this. If you don't have output in production, there's no reason for money to exist in the first place. I mean, the, the only reason that a monetary economy even exists is because we have output that we want to trade with one another. So in a barter type system, we would you wouldn't need money. You would just trade this good for that good and, you know, sort of an I scratch my or you scratch my back, I scratch yours type of economy. But money changes the whole dynamic. Money allows me to get a back scratch from you and then I take the money and I can go and I have basically some sort of monetary item that is worth that quantity of back scratches but I can use it on anything so it basically is sort of a trust based system that provides us with flexibility but what's interesting here is that a lot of people think of money as something that maybe should be unregulated or something that the supply of should be sort of managed or massaged. If you read a lot of academic work, they focus on really managing the money supply. The whole idea of monetarism is really based on the idea of the central bank managing the money supply. And it's interesting what we've sort of built in a modern credit based system where banks are the primary issuers of money is really a market based system. The monetary supply really it expands and contracts in an elastic way, which means that basically the market chooses how much money should exist at times by making new loans and by repaying loans. The money supply can literally expand and contract, but there's a linkage there between the money supply and output ultimately. So we can demand more money, but ultimately one of the key linkages that makes the system viable is how well that money is actually used. So are we borrowing money and going out and speculating on the stock market or are we borrowing money and we're actually building things? Are we building things that add real value to the economy and they make that base of the of the whole financial system broader? And that's why I kept going back to innovation earlier. Innovation is such a key portion of all of this because it is the thing that drives ultimately output and production and makes all of this sustainable. I sort of think of laws and regulation as being, if to use a, a bad sports analogy, if we think of all of this as sort of being something like a soccer game, we're all basically trying to obtain the balls, which would be synonymous with something like the, the money to try to score goals. And goals would be the synonymous with basically creating more output or production. And the government is just sort of there to set the boundaries and make sure that people aren't committing fouls and doing things that could harm the process of trying to get the ball into the goal, basically. So government has an important process to play in terms of the system adheres to those laws. And that's really the crucial part that government plays in all of this is that government can come in and sort of be an independent party that oversees everything that says, okay, the system is credit worthy because if you need to go to court because somebody isn't be good on their monetary promise, the court can kind of come in and intervene and they can literally, they can give credit 
to the money that we utilize because people realize that they have some sort of independent party that's going to regulate and actually make this viable to some degree in the long term and uphold contracts, which is such an important part of all of this. So, Colin, one of the things that I'm most impressed of with this white paper and some of the other talking points that you have on your website is that you really debunk this money multiplier or reserve ratio piece of what they teach in any economics course across the country. And you suggest that after the U.S. came off the gold standard that the banks have been really driving this supply of money or credit that's being created into the system. So can you walk our audience through this idea so that we can understand this more clearly? And just so everyone knows, Colin is effectively saying that the money multiplier used to have an impact up until this point where we really kind of came off this backed monetary baseline. And once we didn't have anything that was backed, really kind of the banks were taking control at that point. So Colin, if you could describe this in a little bit more detail so people can kind of understand your vantage point, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. So this is actually a lot simpler than it probably seems. I think the crucial part of all of this is getting the causation right. So a lot of people tend to work from the idea that the government controls the monetary system, basically, that the government prints money and that the government kind of oversees and either the central bank prints the money or the treasury prints the money. And that's not really an accurate way to think of all of this. I think of the government more as a facilitating entity, whereas the current financial system has really come to be dominated by private sector entities. I mean, the banks are, for all practical purposes, they are the real money printers because they're the ones that when they create loans, loans create deposits. But you have to get the causation there, right? A lot of people especially if you've taken a a course on economics, you think that the deposit base or what economists call the broad money supply, which is the, the basically the supply of money that banks control, they think of that as some sort of a ratio. And so you might have $1 of reserves in the reserve market, which is the market that the, the central bank controls, which would allow banks to create $10 worth of broad money. That's not really how any of this works, though. The way that it really works for all practical purposes is that banks create the broad money. And then if they need reserves, they tend to borrow them after the fact. So loans are actually made before the reserves are even needed. And if the reserves are needed, the central bank actually has to respond to what the banking system's needs are. A central bank is basically just a clearinghouse that operates with government leverage that basically keeps wheels going during scary times, basically. And this is exactly what we saw during 2008, is that the Federal Reserve kept operating even when J.P. Morgan wouldn't lend in the overnight market to Bank of America. The Federal Reserve stepped in and they said, we'll make a market here. We'll lend to whoever needs it to keep the wheels greased here or to keep the engine greased here. I think it's really interesting that you're talking about this, Colin, because I would really like to keep talking about the Federal Reserve. If I have a normal household, I can run out of money. But as you were talking about, the Federal Reserve, they don't have the same constraints. One of the things you talk about in your work is also how the risk for the central bank is not the solvency issues, but rather inflation and the foreign currency risk. So could you explain those concepts and why it's a risk for the central bank? Yeah, so... Again, to kind of use a really simple analogy, a central bank operates in a lot of ways like the government's bank, basically. It's kind of been strange to think about over the course of the last seven years. One of the things we keep hearing about, the debt ceiling, for instance, is coming up again. And we're hearing about how the U.S. government can't afford all of the things that it has to pay for these days. And this always kind of makes me laugh because the U.S. government has a bank that it can borrow from at 0%. And whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I mean, I'm not making a political statement about all this. Coming from an operational perspective, there is literally no way that the U.S. government can run out of money right now. I mean, they are an entity that can sell debt at 0% interest rates. So they're literally their credit line right now is bottomless, completely bottomless. In addition to being able to tax 22% of all world output, issuing the world's real safe haven asset, which is the U.S. government bond as sort of the reserve currency issuer 
we're inherently the the entity that issues the world's safest assets, basically. There's no real solvency constraint there like there is for a household. So, you know, you might be able to run out of money, but if you had an infinite credit line, if you had a, basically a credit line at a bank where you could go in and you could borrow at 0%, you would never worry about running out of money. That's the exact situation that the U.S. government is in. And yet we continually hear about how the U.S. government has some sort of solvency risk, just like a household does. And it's just not true. What the government really has to worry about is creating so much liquidity or incentivizing people in such a way that you basically dilute that output base to the point where you have so much liquidity chasing so few goods and services that then we start to see sort of a South American problem. South America has been just a, a great example of mismanagement of basically fiscal and monetary policy over the course of the last 30 years, because what they've really tried to do is time and time again, they've tried to basically create money as an alternative for output. And they've never really had the output base from which to be able to leverage their governments. And so You've had a lot of cases of hyperinflation and high inflation, and then in a lot of cases, really nasty currency situations. And that's the big risk that you have to worry about is if you have an economy that has a fragile output base where the government then is being involved in such a way that they're trying to almost print output. You can't print output, really. You can incentivize people to create output in certain ways, but you can't print innovation and things like that. And that's the problem that a lot of governments run into. But with regards to the United States, it's a very, very unique situation. There's a certain exorbitant privilege, as economists would phrase it, because we're such a uniquely innovative and diverse economy with diverse resource access and a really mature and diverse economy in so many ways. So there's a lot of specifics. I hate to generalize about this because I don't want to give people the impression that the U.S. government, because it has access to a basically a credit card that has a, an infinite amount of money on it, that that's necessarily a good thing. But I think that coming from an operational perspective and understanding that the government doesn't necessarily have the same solvency issue as a household is really crucial for keeping things in the proper perspective. Yeah, and Colin, it's so interesting that you bring up the uniqueness and complexity of the American monetary system. So I teach macroeconomics here in Denmark, and I would use American textbooks because America is so different, really, from everything else. Yeah, well, and the financial systems are all different. So I wrote my paper, for instance, from the American perspective, obviously, and you wouldn't believe how many international emails I get and people asking me, well, how does this apply to... Europe. Well, Europe has been a really interesting thing to talk about over the course of the last 15 years as their whole, the Euro project has sort of unfolded because Europe, it's an incomplete version of the United States financial system in a lot of ways, because what you have there is basically the European Central Bank is not really controlled by a centralized government. So you have basically a foreign central bank, and then you don't have a global treasury for the entire euro system. So what you have, though, is you have a system that is basically united through using the same currency, but you don't have all of these other interlocking pieces that actually sort of complete the monetary union. So it's funny, Jim Rickards says that he feels that the euro is actually a stronger currency than the dollar or a currency that's going to hold its value better than the dollar because of that structure. Would you agree with that? Well, the likelihood is that Europe's economy will remain in a sort of depressed state until they resolve a lot of this, because what's happening basically is that you have an inherent trade imbalance inside of Europe. So a lot of people don't realize this, but in the United States, for instance, we have trade imbalances here. We basically have 50 little countries and we all use the same currency. But a lot of these countries are a lot more productive than others. So New York and Texas and California are kind of the big ones. They're kind of the Germanys of the Euro system. So they're the biggest exporters of goods and services. And 
this naturally creates a trade imbalance inside of all of the states. But what happens, a lot of people don't realize this, is that you don't get big Greek-like financial crises every once in a while inside of the United States because you have a central government that offsets a lot of the imbalances that occur. So, for instance, a lot of the southeastern states like Alabama and Mississippi, they are huge importers of these goods and services, which means they're basically exporters of dollars. Okay, so they're just like Greece. And in order to offset the income outflow, they basically need some other source of income. It has to come from somewhere. Does it come from borrowing? Do they issue more municipal bonds or do they get money from the federal government? Well, in the case of the USA, they end up getting huge amounts. They're the biggest beneficiaries of federal funding. So the big states like California, Texas, and New York, they actually get as a percentage of their GDP, they get a lot less federal funding than a lot of the smaller, um, less productive states do. And the situation though, in for instance, with Greece is, Greece doesn't get federal funding from anywhere. They actually are being told that they have to deleverage, that there's no support mechanism for what they're doing basically, that they have to implement austerity. I mean, Greece is literally going through a depression right now. It's the closest thing to a modern day depression that really any fairly substantial economy has gone through. It's just not a good situation for Greece because they don't have the political unity that's required to make their system viable. But at the same time, Germany doesn't want to let these smaller, weaker countries out of the euro because Germany is the biggest beneficiary of the weak euro. So if you had all these weaker peripheral countries peel out of the euro, ultimately, that's an inherent price hike for everything that's produced inside of Germany. Because what happens is, For instance, if Greece and Italy and Spain and Portugal all left the euro, they'd bring back their old currencies. They would become just infinitely more competitive against what is essentially becoming a German currency, basically. That's phenomenal. I love that discussion. Changing gears just a little bit, Colin. So when we look at the high yield bond market right now, it's a really popular topic. You got guys like Carl Icahn out there basically saying the doom and gloom is coming. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that a lot of people are selling out of this bond market, which is raising the yield in the high yield bond market. In general, are we seeing the credit cycle starting to contract, regardless of whether the Fed raises rates here in the uh, the federal funds rate in the near term, say they do it in the next six months? Are you seeing worldwide the, the credit cycle starting to contract? Is this starting to spin in the opposite direction? And if so, what ramifications or expectations do we have moving forward? Well, so we're not technically in a deleveraging, especially in the United States. I think it's important to be really specific about which sectors we're talking about. So when we look at, for instance, in the United States, what happened in the period from basically from 2002 up until fairly recently, really 2013, was we had this huge boom and bust in credit. In specifically, it was household credit. You had lots of people speculating on houses and doing sort of funny things with the housing ATM situation and buying cars they probably couldn't afford. And so household credit really boomed in the 2002 to 2007 period, basically. What happened was basically that created a very fragile sort of situation where we had basically built a credit boom based on a very fragile pricing mechanism, which was the real estate market. We had such a huge increase in real estate prices that the value of the assets that was underlying so much of this debt, it made everything very unsustainable. And when the price of houses began to basically contract, you got this domino effect. The business sector in the United States has been actually really healthy over the course of the last 15 years. And it's interesting that what we've seen over the course of the last, really the last five to 10 years as the the credit crisis has played out to some degree, as households have deleveraged in the United States, businesses have actually leveraged up. So we've had a big boom in corporate borrowing in the last five years. And obviously the biggest player in all of this was the government. The government became a huge borrower in the post-crisis period. And this offset what was happening at the household level to a large degree. 
So you have to kind of get a little bit more granular. We're not having a broad deleveraging in the United States, but we're still in a situation where relative to historical norms, the household sector in particular is still borrowing far less than they have historically. And so this is a sign of still very tepid balance sheet strength because this is one of the main drivers of the economy. Ironically, you want the money supply to be expanding through loans over time because that's a sign that things are are actually healthy. When businesses are borrowing and people are borrowing and utilizing that money for good purposes, for good productive purposes, that's a sign that things are actually good. You want to see that happening. Really good answer, Colin. I have a question about exchange rates that I've been thinking of quite a while since I read Jim Rickards' paper. And he's talking about the advantages of the American dollar being packed to something and the pros and cons of doing it. So first of all, he might be talking about paying doll to gold like we used to. The other one would be paying it to another currency. And he also explores the opportunities of being packed to a basket of currencies. Could you imagine a situation from your point of view where it would be beneficial for Americans? Well, I don't really understand the rationale for doing this because I think this tends to be a function of the view that the government controls the exchange rate necessarily or that the government controls the money supply more importantly. And historically, there have been times where governments have directly controlled the money supply. But in a today's monetary system, for all practical purposes, the money supply is really controlled by the private sector. The private sector plays the most important role as the, the issuers of money through primarily through loans. And so I don't see what the benefit would be to pegging the dollar to either a hard commodity or even another currency. It, the general goal is to basically to tie the hands of the government to some degree to make it more difficult for them to issue money. But we've sort of seen this. I mean, quantitative easing is the best example that I like to use. The government is a facilitator of the monetary system, basically. And so to use a really simple example of what quantitative easing is, Quantitative easing is basically changing the composition of private sector financial assets. What the government does is when they implement quantitative easing, the central bank basically prints uh, reserves or you can think of them as printing deposits into the financial system and exchanging them with some other type of financial assets. So, for instance, if I hold a treasury bond, maybe the central bank comes to me and they give me a deposit and I give them the bond. I'm not wealthier. I don't have more money. My net worth hasn't increased. In fact, the private sector's net worth is exactly the same after quantitative easing has been implemented. All right, Colin, this is our last question. What book do you recommend? And specifically, what investment text has drastically shaped your thinking? So this might actually surprise a lot of people, but I'm actually a huge advocate of simplicity. So although I kind of work from what is a seemingly complex perspective of the world. My goal with all of this is actually really vastly simplify everything to sort of condense all of this into very simple forms of understandings. And the the book that I love that I think is just the most direct, simplistic way of understanding what is generally the best way of allocating assets for people is John Bogle's little book of common sense investing. I think that he just does a masterful way of explaining how simple this whole process should be. At the end of the day, although a lot of this can get bogged down in the complexities of all of this stuff endlessly, if you can really simplify all of this as best you can, I've always been a huge advocate of simplicity. And I think that Bogle just is sort of the master at all right, Colin, just fantastic information. We want to make sure that everyone in our audience has a handoff back to your different sites and all the things that you have on the internet. So please tell them where they can learn more about you. Yeah, so the best place to go is pragcap.com. That's P-R-A-G-C-A-P. The website's uh, Pragmatic Capitalism. And that's just, it's my personal blog, but I have, gosh, I've, I mean, I've posted so much sort of educational material. There's so much, I think there's so much misinformation out there about the way that the financial markets work and just the way that the monetary system works because of really people's behavioral biases and more importantly, their 
political biases. There's just so much misinformation out there about the way things work. And I like to view these, all of these things sort of through the perspective of an engineer. If we can understand how the monetary vehicle works, we can understand what certain pedals do and gears do and how they operate in certain ways. And so a lot of my stuff is just very operational and educational. And I don't know if it's all right or applies to every monetary system out there, but I think a refreshing sort of perspective because it's operational. Fantastic. Stig, did you have anything else? No, not other than Colin always has a standing invitation to join us on a podcast. I mean, this was amazing and right up our alley. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. It was really a blast. I hope I wasn't too all over the place. I know we covered a lot of ground. so No, it, it was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Colin. And I'm sure we'll probably send you another invite here in the near future. So thank you so much. That would be awesome. Thank you. All right, so this is the point in the show where we take a question from the audience, and this question comes from Matthew Wong. Hi, Preston Stig. My name's Matthew. I'm calling from Ireland. I'm a huge fan of the show. Uh, my question is just in relation to the loyal, low oil prices, which I'm hoping to get some exposure to. I'm reluctant to buy into oil ETFs. I think that the 12-month future contracts that would have been locked in by some oil companies around this time last year at the decent prices of whatever, around $100 a barrel. Those will be expiring soon. And I can see multiple companies going bankrupt in the next six to 12 months, as long as the Saudis continue to keep the, the oil prices down. So I'm reluctant to buy into the ETFs just because, you know, obviously that portfolio will then include some of these companies that are more likely to go bankrupt. And I guess that leaves the individual companies. I've been considering maybe Philips 66, the fact that Buffett invested in them gives them a stamp of approval but yeah my question really is just are you guys investing in oil ETS? thanks a lot guys appreciate it so matthew this question is really a good question and i think that this is one that a lot of people in our audience have so i am not right now i am not investing in anything that's oil related and that doesn't mean that that's right that just means that i'm a little scared and timid to dive in at this point without really knowing how everything's going to shake out Something that I can say that I'm kind of surprised by, and I know we had Trey Knipp on the show. He said he was surprised by the price action in the oil commodity, where it really went down. It was down into the $39 level for basically a couple days, and then it came back out, and it's now up at like $45 to $50, and it's been kind of bouncing around that $45 to $50 range. What I find really amazing is our friend Morgan Downey, he told Stig and I specifically, he said, if oil drops down into the $30 range, it'll only be there for a couple of days. He was dead right. I mean, dead right. Now, going to where do we go from this point forward and into the future? So my opinion is that the, the Saudis and some of the other countries that produce oil at a very cheap level, like they can pull it out of the ground at $10 a barrel and still be profitable. I really think that they have this approach that they're going to try to keep oil at the $50 to $60 range. I really think that that's going to persist until they shake out a lot of these companies that are like the, the frackers up in Canada, the oil sands. I think they are trying to demolish that business so that they can gain their market share back in the long run. I think this is a long-term strategy. That's what I really think is happening. I could be 100% wrong with that. I don't have any inside source over in Saudi Arabia or anywhere else that would be telling me this. This is just from the different articles that I read. And what I think they're really trying to do is get their market share back. And I think they're trying to do that by supplying the amount of volume of oil that, that they're producing until these defaults actually start to occur. So that's why I'm waiting. That's why I don't think that it's going anywhere anytime soon. And I really don't think that I'm missing the opportunity because I... I think there's more to come. I don't think that we're at the bottom here. I think that you're going to see more of this play out as time goes on and things mature and develop. So I don't feel like I'm missing the boat here. I think that it's going to be something that persists for a little bit longer. I do believe, and I, I want people to understand this, I think there's a huge opportunity here, a huge opportunity. But I think it really depends on when that oil price is going to start coming back up and start to go higher. Until that, you, you start to see that shift, that consistent shift start to take place. I'm just going to hold tight and maybe get in a little too late, but I think that I'm going to mitigate potential risks, especially from a global standpoint, by waiting for that. So that's my opinion. I'm really curious to hear what Stig has to say. 
Well, first of all, Matthew, I think it's a great question. And the reason why is that you're seeing cheap oil and you're thinking opportunity. You're not looking at cheap oil and thinking that's a problem. I need to run away from that. That's a question from a real value investor. So first of all, immensely props for that one. Contrary to Preston, I am actually invested in oil. I'm not invested in an ETF and it's really not on purpose. And I know it sounds strange, but I don't have the same access. To so for instance, if I here in Denmark try to invest from my 401k, it's not legal because here in Denmark, the authorities have claimed that it's too risky. We don't know enough about American ETFs, so we cannot allow Danish investors to hold American ETFs. So if I was to answer your question, I'm not, but I would really like to. And I wrote a blog post about investing in all ETFs, and you can find that on theinvestorpodcast.com, and uh, it's under the blog section. So I want to comment on the oil ETF piece of this. So I I would think that investing in individual companies is going to end up being a little bit better for an individual. I think that the big, large cap companies that have strong balance sheets are going to be the ones that benefit the most from all of this simply because they're going to be able to buy up the capital resources when these companies do go bankrupt and some of these aren't able to produce and be profitable. They're going to have fire sale opportunities for large cap companies that have managed their finance well when they buy their uh, capital assets. So that's why I think maybe going after individual picks in companies that have really strong balance sheets and that have been managed really well through the years, I think those are the companies that are going to benefit most from this after it does start turning around. Great point, Preston. And you might well well be right. I'm investing in individual stocks right now. Actually, just a few weeks ago, I bought into them and with this strong balance sheet, as you suggest, and could they go lower? Well, of course they can. The reason why I do still invest in them is that I'm looking at a 3% yield right now, and basically this is for companies I consider close to be risk-free, and I kind of feel like I'm waiting for a strong upside. Now, I want to say two things. I am looking to increase my exposure if I see a severe price drop again. The second part, which is very, very important too, is that I could very easily be wrong. And if I'm wrong, I still want to be exposed if you don't see the drop and I missed my shot to invest while the price is low. Okay, so that's all we have. We're going to go ahead and send Matthew a free signed copy of our book, The Warren Buffett Accounting Book, for asking that fantastic question. And if you're like Matthew and you want to get your question played on our show, go to asktheinvestors.com and you can record your question there. So we'd really like to thank our guest, Colin, for coming on the show. As you guys can see, Colin is extremely smart. We highly recommend all of his white papers. We're going to have a link to all those on our show notes, so make sure you check that out. And we just want to thank our audience for joining us today. We really appreciate everything that you guys do for us. So with that, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. 